hear my cry, my cry for her true, my cry for her true, my cry for you. Welcome to the Hey Pastor podcast. I am Pastor Mark Lambert from Liberty Hill Baptist Church in Moody, where I serve as pastor to my congregation, husband to my wife, father to my children, and to everyone as an ongoing example that God does indeed choose the weak and foolish things out of the world. Hey, that was a recent sermon title. You can check that out at lhbcmoody.org. Um, as well as find past episodes of this podcast, our question and answer events on the question and answer page there at the website. Check that all out there at lhbcmoody.org. Today, I want to discuss sin, sin and evil and darkness. Um, So it's going to be a very cheerful and happy podcast. Glad to have you along. Actually, what we're going to talk about are three things. Uh, One is just something that is timely, and two are questions that I have received. If you would like to have a question addressed on this podcast, you can go to the website and submit a question through the question form on the podcast page, and I would be happy to address that. Now, also, we do have the regular question and answer events that happen about quarterly, where I and maybe some guests, if I can round some up, will answer any question. But those tend to be on the spot, uh, free flow off the top of our head answers. Here on the podcast, I tend to uh, dig in and I give you more uh, thorough of an answer. So before we get into the questions, one thing I want to address is this issue of Halloween. Right here we are. It's mid-October, maybe late October. Halloween is fast approaching, and we are followers of Christ. And there is an ongoing uh, debate among people about should Christians celebrate Halloween. Uh, I grew up uh, dressing up for Halloween, trick-or-treating. You got the bucket or the bag of candy. You know, you you run around and fill up a, a pillowcase full of candy. And if you are a very enterprising young person, you switch costumes, grab a new bag and go back out. That's kind of shady. I don't know that I would suggest that. Um, but then you have the people, I have a very good friend of mine, who will say uh, that Halloween, it is a celebration of darkness, it is uh, Satan's holiday, that Christians have no place in it. Even churches that have like a trunk or treat or a fall festival, they're putting on the trappings of a holiday of evil, and so that should be avoided. So what is the answer? How should we as Christians think about and approach Halloween? Okay, well, as I answer this, I'm going to uh, answer from a historical uh, and and then a practical standpoint. So historically, what is the deal with Halloween? We've probably all heard the kind of uh, claims that it is based off of pagan holidays and dark rituals and that sort of thing. All right, well, let's take a look at that. The name Halloween is a contraction. It's a blending of words. Uh, The words All Hallows Eve is actually the full name of the holiday. All Hallows Eve. Uh, Hallow means to be holy, right? To be uh, sacred. Uh, Evening, right? Uh, Eve is from evening, so it's All Hallows Eve, which um, contracted down to uh, Hallow In, right? Right, With that apostrophe E in, uh, which just kind of gets shortened down to Halloween. So, what is All Hallows Eve? Well, All Hallows Eve is referring to the evening before what's called all Holy's Day or All Saints Day, which is on November 1st uh, in the church calendar, right? Um, <clears throat> all Saints Day is a celebration of the saints. Originally, that meant those who had been martyred for their faith, who had been you know, put to death for their following of Christ. And All Hallows' Eve was part of that holiday. It was the evening before. And this is a church holiday. This is on the church calendar. Uh, so much as Protestants don't observe it, uh, as much as maybe the Catholics or other liturgical churches like Lutherans or Episcopalians. Um, but this is a church holiday. 
Now, originally, not all churches celebrated this on the same day, right? There was no one correct date for it, but all churches generally celebrated throughout, uh, at the time, Catholic Church was the only thing going. And all the regional churches celebrated it at some point, that they would celebrate the sacrifice made by the martyrs and the saints, and that's what it was. It was a celebration of this. Um, but there was no one single day, right? There was no one this is the day you celebrate it. All kind of churches did it all its own. So how did it end up becoming associated with October 31st, with November 1st? Right. This is where people will claim that it was a, uh, a plan to co-opt this pagan holiday and to Christianize the pagans. And what they did is they, the pagans had this holiday that was the Day of the Dead. And that uh, Christians said, hey, we have a day celebrating dead. And we took our holiday, imposed it on theirs, and sought to take over and Christianize them. That is not what happened. I know it's a popular tale, but it's just really not what happened. Uh, Pope Gregory III, who was uh, in office in the 700s uh, there in the 8th century, he is credited with choosing the date of November 1st. Whenever he dedicated this chapel in uh, St. Peter's Basilica in Rome, and he dedicated to all the saints, and he just established that day as an annual celebration in Rome. So it wasn't even like all throughout the um, empire yet. It, it was just in Rome. He consecrated this chapel and established it as an annual celebration, and he set the date for it in Rome. Now later, Pope Gregory the Fourth. Uh, about 100 years later, he extended the holiday to all Christians by formally adding it to the church's liturgical calendar in 835 AD. But what about all this evil stuff, right? Isn't it rooted in this pagan worship? What, what about that Celtic holiday that no one knows how to pronounce right? right? Wasn't that the root of Halloween? Well, that, that pagan holiday that people generally point to as the root of Halloween is called uh, Samhain. It's spelled Samhain, S-A-M-H-E-I-N, how it's pronounced Sao in, I have no idea. But um, this is the Celtic kind of autumn festival. We have no historical indication that it was some occultic celebration of the Day of the Dead, that it was some uh, dark and demonic holiday. The records just don't exist, right? The culture of the northern Celts that celebrated this holiday, they were not a literate society. They didn't write things down. They didn't keep those kind of records. And the references that we do have come from centuries later, and they indicate that it was some kind of fall festival, right? A harvest, harvest celebration that all cultures basically had, right? Because the harvest just came in, winter's coming up, everything is plenty. It's a time that people would celebrate the bounty, Right, that they would thank whatever God they worship for uh, the harvest that they received. Uh, the, the days are getting shorter, the nights are getting longer, so they're spending more time with family and friends around campfires and telling stories. And, and fall festival kind of thing. All cultures had some sort of celebration like this. And, and all indication was that this is all that was, that the Celts were um, celebrating this sort of holiday. Now, to be sure, uh, from what we do know, that they were a superstitious people, right? So it's likely that elements of their superstition were included in their celebration and their storytelling, but we, we don't really know what those would have been, right? They probably would have included fairies and leprechauns and, you know, those kinds of things. And so, uh, you know, you would get the mystical creature aspect in there. But here's the thing. By the time that this date of November 1st, of October 31st for All Hallows' Eve, was decreed by Pope Gregory in the 700s, Ireland had already been Christian for a few centuries. Right? There, there would have been no need to take over and Christianize this pagan festival in order to convert them. They were already converted. Like, no one was actually celebrating Samhain at the time that All Hallows' Eve was established on October 31st. It just wasn't a thing. And even if it were, it's highly doubtful that this fall festival activity of this relatively small group of people way off on the fringes of the Roman Empire would have drawn the attention of the Pope, much less would have been enough for him to declare an empire-wide holiday whenever all they're really doing is focusing on this little bitty group that nobody even cares about.
So the roots of Halloween aren't actually grounded in a pagan festival. It, it's actually a very Christian holiday, very much a Christian holiday. It was a time to celebrate um, those who had given their lives for Christ. Okay, but what about all of this imagery about death and witches and goblins? Well, if anything, it was probably the Christian influence of All Saints Day, which focused on the afterlife. Right? If you throw in the teachings from the uh, Catholic Church of Purgatory, an obsession with death in the minds of people would make sense. Right? Because they are um, celebrating people who have given their life, uh, people who have died for the faith. And what does it mean to die? There's some focus on the afterlife. Um, and there's this purgatory thing where everything seems kind of bleak, where uh, whenever you die, you're either going to go to judgment or you're going to go to purgatory where you suffer to work off your sin. And so um, the afterlife was not really all that happy, rosy of a picture, whether you're good or bad. And so th this focus on death, I mean, you can see where that might grow out of it. Now, this pop culture kind of Americanized version that we are familiar with has more to do with some of the superstitious elements. Um, we had an influx of Irish immigrants at one point, um, and you know, I mean, just large amounts of people from Ireland, and so with their superstition, um, brought this into American culture. You know, but elsewhere in the world, Halloween is a recognized part of the Christian liturgical calendar. It's an official holiday to be celebrated by the church just as much as, say, Easter or Christmas. Well, but okay, but in our culture, we have all this uh, occultish imagery, right? These traditions, things that people do, uh, like trick-or-treating, right? Isn't that rooted in some pagan practice of uh, practical joking or scaring people? Or you know, just I don't, I've heard all sorts of different issues. Well, actually, no. Uh, there's some indication that the practice of trick-or-treating was actually rooted in a tradition of poor people going door-to-door -door asking for alms, right? At this time of year, it was getting colder. The need was greater. You just had the harvest, so there was plenty. People actually had something to give, and according to one source that I read, people would dress up as they would go door-to-door -door asking for handouts, uh, one, in order to give some anonymity, right? It's just a shame factor where, you know, you, know, you have a mask on, um, but it would also be kind of a way to earn their treat, right? There, there's some uh, tales of even people acting out plays, right, with religious themes because it's a holiday. It's a religious holiday, and so they would come and they would act out a play um, of maybe a saint giving their life and being martyred. And you know, guess what? Plays have bad guys, and so who are the bad guys in religious plays? Well, it's going to be the devil, right? So you might have people dressed up as these demons or devils or monsters who are the bad guys in this play. And you can go through all the usual trappings of jack-o'-lanterns and et cetera, and you can find that the usual claims of being them as being rooted in satanic, occultish practices are usually made up. Okay, so should Christians participate? Here, here's really where I fall on this. Whatever the root of the holiday, whatever past cultures may have thought about it, I think it really comes down to what does this mean to you? There's one area where I'm going to tell you to follow your conscience. Hey, you know what? If you're kind of like, I don't know, should I do this? Is it bad? Don't do it. Right? But, but if, if, if you're feeling like it's no big deal, we're just having fun, right? Clearly, there are certain aspects that would be troublesome for Christians. And do away with those. Right? Witchcraft and things like that that are expressly forbidden in Scripture, that'd be a no-no. Right? Don't let your kids dress up as witches or goblins or whatever, you know, or, or the devil or however you want to do that, right? Um, but when it comes to the other things, I mean, what really is going on in 21st century America Halloween? People are dressing up in goofy costumes, they're going door to door asking candy, and they're having fun. They're hanging out with friends, they're having a good time. And they're eating a bunch of candy. Pretty much the only uh, sin that I'm seeing risking in there is gluttony, right? So let's just careful there. 
right? But w whatever we consider to be the real meaning of Halloween as it exists today, it is such a mishmash of cultural ideas that I don't even think you can really name it as being a Christian holiday or even some dark pagan day. Like I said, mostly the meaning of Halloween in America is an excuse to dress up, have parties, have some fun, and get some candy. My family and I, we do celebrate Halloween, right? We don't allow the, the dark elements, the, the, the witches and the, all that, that stuff, the things the Bible would definitely explicitly call sin. But there's nothing sinful about dressing up and being goofy, right? Eating candy, right? Again, in case you're eating too much, then that would be sinful. Gluttony, right? But that's not a Halloween issue. So, so the issue with Halloween is what exactly is it? I mean, there's people who celebrate Christmas who have absolutely nothing to do with Jesus. There's people who celebrate Easter who have absolutely nothing to do with a cross or resurrection. And, and so in the same way, we can celebrate Halloween, which whatever elements might have whatever background to them, that's not why we're doing it. That's not what we mean. It has absolutely nothing to do with what we're celebrating. And so I, I, I think that uh, you need to follow your conscience but that Christians are free to celebrate Halloween. Now, we know that Halloween is not a sin, and we're not supposed to sin, but there are some things that are sin. And doesn't Jesus tell us, this brings us to our first question, how is it that we can go and sin no more? Right? Doesn't Jesus tell us that we're supposed to sin no more? But is that even possible to sin? Or don't we all sin at certain different times? Well, I think the Bible is clear that being born again doesn't give us these magical powers to never do bad things ever again. Plus, in Romans 7, Paul describes this ongoing battle that he is having between temptation and obedience. And most of the New Testament is made up of letters to Christians warning or encouraging them to not sin or telling them to help one another to not sin or to pray for someone who is sinning. 1 John 2, 1 says, My little children, these things I write to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ. So I think we also know this intuitively. Right? What, what does Jesus say is the greatest commandment? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. And the second is like it. Right? Do you every day always love the Lord with all of your heart, mind, soul, and strength? Right? Do you love your neighbor as yourself? If we're honest, we have to say no. Right? So it's not possible to never sin. Right? We're not going to be made holy uh, this side of the grave completely. So what did Jesus mean when he commanded us to go and sin no more? Well, back up a second, because I think interpretation matters. You have to read it correctly. Did Jesus command us? to go and sin no more? What is the context of those words? There's two instances where Jesus tells someone, go and sin no more. The first one uh, there is woman caught in adultery, John chapter 8, right? Um, she's brought before Jesus. Uh, the people say, you know, the, the religious leaders are trying to trick him up, say she was caught in adultery, says she should be stoned. What do you say? And he says, let he who is without guilt cast the first stone. Everybody drops their stones and walks away. Um, and Jesus tells her, you know, where are your accusers? And she said, there's no one. He says, neither do I condemn you. Now go and sin no more. Okay, what I see going on there is that she got a second chance. Jesus is telling her not to squander her freedom by returning to her sinful life. So she was just caught in adultery. She's a criminal, but she was not indicted. She was not found guilty of her crime. And Jesus is saying, don't do it again. At the pool of Bethesda in John chapter 5, we have the same kind of thing. Jesus uh, heals a man. This is where he goes by the man sitting by the pool, asks the man, do you want to be well? The guy says, yeah, but he can't make it into the water. Jesus heals him, tells him, get up and walk. Later, Jesus comes and finds him and says, you are well again. Now stop sinning or something worse may happen to you. Right? So is Jesus telling him to stop sinning? Never again, never again do any more sins. No, I, there's a chance, and some commentaries have said, that the infirmity that Jesus had healed him of had been a result of his sinful choices. Now, the Bible doesn't specifically say that, but I think it makes sense. Jesus is warning him not to return to his old ways, which caused his problem in the first place. 
So whenever Jesus is saying, go and sin no more, what he's equal saying is, don't do it again. Go and don't do that sin anymore. So while we are growing in holiness, we're not there yet. And we will not be perfectly holy this side of the grave. So there's going to be times that we sin. There's going to be things that we struggle, but we, um, we, we, we repent of those things. We confess them to God. We thank him for his grace and we press on towards holiness, growing more and more into the likeness and image of Christ. And that brings us to the second question. Well, okay, if we can sin, then what does it mean that there is a sin that leads to death? Okay, this is found in 1 John chapter 5. Well, so what is a sin that leads to death? Some people will say, there's there's several views, and I'll kind of lay them out, and I'll tell you which one I uh, think is correct. There's some people who say it's a degree of sin. Right? There, there are some sins are worse than others, and a sin that leads to death, well, that's just a really, really, really bad one. That's just a terrible sin. Oh, that's just horrible. Um, I don't think that's true. That would imply that there are sins which Christ's sacrifice could not pay for. There are some deeds that are so vile that there cannot be enough grace for you. Now, while different sins certainly have different earthly consequences, and the Bible, I think, teaches that they will earn us different eternal consequences, all sin is essentially the same in that whether you're stealing a peck of gum or committing murder, when it comes to your crime against God, you are rejecting his authority, his purposes, his design. You are choosing to be your own authority. It is rebellion against God. So I don't think it's degrees of sin at view here. Second, there's the notion of physical death, a sin that leads to death. This could be the case. I'm not going to favor this one, but it makes sense, right? Um, that, that he's saying, hey, you know, if your brother or sister uh, sins, pray for him. Uh, unless it's a sin that leads to death, then don't pray for him. Well, I mean, that makes sense. They're dead. Uh, well, why pray for him? But, but I don't think that's quite it. Because uh, the whole context of this book is spiritual. And John, the author, is known for his figurative use of life and death and light and dark and that sort of thing. So the question is, is this figurative? Does John mean this as some kind of symbolism about something? Well, there, there's two possibilities that uh, tend to be put forward. One is that this is kind of a stubborn denial of the gospel, that this is uh, the person who has repeatedly sinned and sinned and sinned and sinned, and they will not accept the truth. And what Romans 1 basically says that God gives them over to their reprobate mind, that God basically says, fine, have it your way. You want to sin? Well, go on. And just washes his hand of them and he lets them have the full force of the consequences of their sin. Uh, people who have a stubborn denial of the gospel and will not repent. I don't think that's it because he's addressing Christians. So we're going to give them the benefit of the doubt that their repentance is genuine. Um, I think this most likely seems to be maybe a reference to the unpardonable sin, which is a whole other podcast to answer what exactly that is. But it is essentially a rejection of Christ. It, it, this is the, the person that Hebrews talks about who um, would have um, been a part of uh, the Christian community, even though not actually internally repentant, that we're giving voice to, I believe this, this makes sense, this is true, I accept this, even though in their heart they were never repentant. Um. And, and so that they would then uh, ascribe to God, um, well, not, not to get into all that, basically it is that they say, you know what, I see that, and I'm not denying that it's probably true, but I don't want it. I don't want any part of you. Right? So this is just a flat-out rejection. It's not a denial, it's a rejection. And so this would be the sin that leads to Death, I think, is probably referring to the unpardonable sin, the person who says, um, yeah, sorry, I, I don't want you, God. Don't pray for him. The whole, the, the whole context of what John is saying, he's, he's saying, hey, pray for each other. If someone's sinning, man, pray for him. But if it's a sin that leads to death, if, if it is them just basically giving the one finger wave to God and walking away, let them go. They're done. The entire context of the book of 1 John is talking about true and false believers and true and false teachers. 
and at one point where it talks about um, they went out from us because they were never part of us. And so what he is saying here, there are some people who are so hard-hearted that are basically giving the one-finger wave to God, and they're saying, no, thank you, I don't want your gospel. And they walk away. Leave them be. Just don't bother. Lost cause, their heart is so hard, just no. But let's look at the real thing being talked about here. Let's not get so bogged down in the weeds and spinning theological hairs over um, what is the sin that leads to death. The whole point of what John is saying in this text is pray for each other. Pray for one another. If you're in sin, pray for one another. Let's hold up one another, bear each other's burdens, be there for one another, seeing one another through the hard times, praying through as we struggle through as we just are eaten up by guilt and shame over our sin as we're trying to be holy and we're failing, that we pray for one another. And if there's someone that they're in that sin and they're not repentant, they're not sorry, they're walking away from God, leave them. Let's focus on the ones in the body who are torn up by our sin and trying to follow Christ but struggle and fall. Let's help one another up and pray for one another. That is the point of what John is writing Whatever the sin that leads to death is, I think the main point of that passage is what we need to know and focus on the most, and that is to be there for one another, pray for one another, lift one another up. And that concludes this podcast. Thank you for listening. Check out other episodes. If you have any other questions you would like to submit, I'd love to hear those. lhbcmoody.org. Uh, thank you. God bless and have a wonderful day. Hear me now, Lord, I'm calling for you to find me.